Let me then, for the first opening statement, invite to the podium Don Carroll. Thank you, Philip. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Before getting into the debatey part of the debate, I wanted to recognize that while it's absolutely true that we disagree, the two sides of the debate, we have things that are very, very important that should be clarified upon which we have very, very different points of view, it's also true that we come here for similar reasons. We share concerns. We're asking the same kinds of questions. What is the fundamental nature of reality? What is humankind's role in the cosmos? And this is why I will always remain stubbornly optimistic that through discussion and reason and rationality, we can actually make progress towards at least understanding, if not agreement, which is why I love uh, debates like this. I think that they are a very good thing to have. Having said that, religion and science have gone their separate ways over the years. 500 years ago, this debate would not have been held. There was no demarcation between what we would now call science and what we would call religion. There was just attempts to understand the world. And what happened is that science came about by developing techniques, methodologies, for gaining reliable knowledge about the world. And the reliable knowledge that we got was incompatible with some of the presuppositions of religious belief. The basic thing that we learned by doing science for 400 years is something called naturalism. The idea that there is only one reality, that there are not separate planes of the natural and the supernatural, that there is only one material existence and we are part of the universe. We do not stand outside of it in any way. And the way that science got there is through basically realizing that human beings are not that smart. <laughs> you are not Vulcans. You're not Mr. Spock. You're not perfectly logical. We as human beings are subject to all sorts of biases and cognitive shortcomings. We tend to be wishful thinkers and to see patterns where they're not there and so forth. And in response to this, science developed techniques for giving ourselves reality checks, for not letting us believe things that the evidence does not stand up to. One technique is simply skepticism, which you may have heard of. Scientists are taught that we should be our own theory's harshest critics. Scientists spend all their time trying to disprove their favorite ideas. This is a remarkable way of doing things that is a little bit counterintuitive, but helps us resist the lure of wishful thinking. The other technique is empiricism. We realize that we are not smart enough to get true knowledge about the world just by thinking about it. We have to go out there and look at the world. And what we've done by this for the last 400 years is to realize that human beings are not separate, that the world is one thing, the natural world, and it can be understood. This is very counterintuitive. This is not at all obvious, this naturalism claim. When you talk to a person, they have thoughts and feelings and responses. When you talk to a dead person, a corpse, I hate to be morbid here, but you don't get those same responses, those same thoughts and feelings. It's very natural, very commonsensical to think that a living person possesses something that a corpse does not, some sort of spirit, some sort of animating soul or life force. But this idea, as it turns out, does not stand up to closer scrutiny. And a big step towards realizing this was made back in the 1600s by a remarkable woman named Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. They made princesses differently back in the 17th century. <laughs> Elizabeth carried on a years-long correspondence with Rene Descartes, who famously tried to develop a theory of mind-body dualism. And Elizabeth said, I don't understand what you're saying, because if you really believe that the mind is in a separate realm from the body, my mind makes a choice to lift my arm, but it's my body that does it. How does the immaterial mind that you say doesn't exist at a location in space, how does it act causally on the body? How does it interact with the stuff out of which you are made? And Descartes never came out up with a reliable, believable response to this objection. Of course, these days, the objection is enormously stronger. We would say, you are made of atoms. You are made of cells, which are made of molecules, which are made of atoms. And as physicists, we know how atoms behave. The laws of physics governing the behavior of atoms are completely understood. You put an atom in a certain set of circumstances. If you tell me what those circumstances are, as a physicist, I will tell you what the atom will do. If you believe that the atoms that are inside your brain and your body act differently because they are in a living person than if they are in a rock or a crystal, 
then what you're saying is that the laws of physics are wrong, that they need to be altered because of the influence of a spirit or a soul or something like that. And that may be true. Science can't disprove that, but there is no evidence for it. And you get a much stronger explanatory framework by assuming that it's just atoms obeying the laws of physics. That kind of reasoning is a big step toward naturalism. Another big step also happened in the 1600s when Galileo came upon the idea of conservation of momentum. And you might say, why does conservation of momentum get in the way of my belief in the existence of God? But it does. Because before Galileo came along, physics was described by Aristotle. And Aristotle said something very, again, something very obvious and commonsensical, that if you want something to keep moving, you need to push it. Things naturally come to rest, left to their own devices. And, but if you look at the world, you realize that things are moving all over the place. So Aristotle very logically eventually concluded that you need to invoke the existence of an unmoved mover, which can be identified, of course, with God. But then, of course, Galileo comes along and says, actually, the natural behavior of matter is to keep moving at a constant velocity. Motion is perfectly natural. When things stop, it's because you are acting on them through friction or air resistance or dissipation. And then Isaac Newton comes along and builds an elaborate edifice of mechanics, which explains the world beautifully in purely material principle. And it's very, very interesting. Once that happened, you realize that the prime mover argument doesn't work as well, and you can actually see a change in the theological literature of the time. Before Newton and Galileo, there was emphasis put on ideas of prime movers and first causes, arguments from cosmology and contingency and so forth. After Newton and Galileo, the argument emphasized something else, the argument from design. People would say, well, sure, you can explain the planets moving, that's easy, but all of the life forms, the marvelous diversity of life here on Earth, that had to be made by some guiding external intelligence. In fact, in the 1700s, Immanuel Kant said, there will never be an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass. Then, of course, in the 1800s, we got an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass. His name was Charles Darwin. Darwin showed how material, matter, all by itself, without guidance, without purpose, without an aim, just by the natural motion of ordinary things, can lead to the marvelous diversity of organic life that we see here on Earth. That was another huge step in the direction of naturalism. Now, of course, I could go on. We could talk about modern cosmology and the origin of the universe. We could talk about neuroscience and what consciousness is and so forth. But I don't want to do that right now. We can maybe talk about it later. But I don't want to do it right now basically because it's kind of boring. And the reason why it's kind of boring is because the argument is finished. The debate is over. We've come to a conclusion. Naturalism has won. If you go to any university physics department, listen to the talks they give or the papers they write, go to any biology department, go to any neuroscience department, any philosophy department, people whose professional job it is to explain the world, to come up with explanatory frameworks that match what we see, no one mentions God. There's never an appeal to a supernatural realm by people whose job it is to explain what happens in the world. Everyone knows that the naturalist explanations are the ones that work. And yet, here we are. We're having a debate. Why are we having a debate? Because, clearly, religion speaks to people for reasons other than explaining what happens in the world. Most people who turn to religious belief do not do so because they think it provides the best theory of cosmology or biology. They turn to religious belief because it provides them with purpose and meaning in their lives, with a sense of right and wrong, with a community, with hope. So if we want to say that science has refuted religion, we need to say that science has something to say about those issues. And on that, I have good news and bad news for you. The bad news is that the universe does not care about you. <laughs> Qua universe. Don't take up my time. I'm in a hurry here. The universe is made of elementary particles that don't have intelligence, don't pass judgment, do not have a sense of right and wrong. And the fear is, the existential anxiety is, that if that purpose and meaningfulness is not given to me by the universe, then it cannot exist. The good news is that that fear is a mistake, that there is another option, that we create purpose and meaning in the world. If you love somebody, it is not because that love is put into you by something outside. It's because you created that from inside yourself. If you act good to somebody, it's not because you're given instructions to do so. It's because that's a choice that you made. 
This is a very scary world. You should be affected at a very deep level by the thought that the universe doesn't care, does not pass judgment on you. But it's also challenging and liberating that we can create lives that are worth living. I've never met God. I've never met any spirits or any angels. But I've met human beings. Many of them are amazing people. And I truly believe that if we accept the universe for what it is, if we approach reality with an open mind and an open heart, then we can create lives very much worth living. Thank you.